Continental vampiritis peaked in the 1720s and 1730s. The Ottoman star was on the wane. Its troops and administrators pushed inexorably, if intermittently, back through the Balkans. Habsburg Catholics, this ascendant military and religious force, stepped into the vacuum. In the wake of the Turkish retreat, conflict continued, ecclesiastical rather than political, this time between Roman Catholicism and Muscovite Orthodoxy. A great wedge of territory, Poland, the Ukraine, Western Russia, the Slav and the Balkan states reverberated to the clash between Christian East and West, each side denying that the dead would find eternal peace in the unhallowed soil of the other. The watershed passed through an area of modern Romania, known as Transylvania. Originally Greek Orthodox, its peasant communities had been exposed to Turkish Islam and then the Catholic proselytization, and were now the terrified and helpless victims of a religious maelstrom. The tentacles of this struggle and its resultant psychosis spread far and wide until larger areas of Central and Eastern Europe were seething under vampire paranoia. As its communications multiplied and popular superstition was played on and manipulated to serve the goal of true belief. An indication of the seriousness with which this epidemic was treated outside the confines of the church can be seen in the response of German Academia. The intellectual climate had entered the so-called rationalist era of the Enlightenment. Learned treatises appeared one after the other between 1728 and 1734, many of them from the prestigious universities of Leipzig, Jena and Nuremberg, each trying to account in theological, psychological, medical or metaphysical terms for the sensational vampire stories reaching them from the East. This was still an age when belief in the existence of God was largely unquestioned and philosophical Philosophical speculation could not easily avoid that pre premise. The vampire seemed self-evidently a diabolic creature permitted by God. As everlasting life awaited the pure and holy, it seemed obvious that this longing for eternity would be imitated and parodied by the devil. Much of the debate, in other words, took place against the framework of the devil's challenge to God's earthly order. Not surprisingly, many of the questions asked were couched in metaphysical terms. Were vampires actual risen corpses or merely souls not yet freed from the earthly bondage? Did the spiritual element of the vampire emanate from its former living existence or was, in, was it animated by the devil, directing an evil spirit to take possession of the body once the soul of the owner had departed? What unknown forces lay behind the supernatural powers of the undead? If the body of the vampire was spectral, how and by what means could it suck the blood of and engage in coitus with the living? Similarly, how could an actual three-dimensional body, dead or otherwise, pass from grave to surface and back again without disturbing the earth between? In sum, could a corporal substance possess astral dimensions. Among the speculative conclusions reached were either that the body of the undead dematerialized before reintegrating outside the grave, or alternatively that another body was somehow created by the vampire, independent of the corpse which remained in the grave. Such notions raised profound theological disquiet. For if vampires were indeed endowed by the devil with such talents, it implied that Satan enjoyed comparable powers to those of Christ after the resurrection. What needs to be appreciated is that popular superstition, ecclesiastical practice, and the most learned minds of the 18th century all fueled the vampire myth. The spreading psychosis could find no remedy for, from physicians, so profit-seeking quacks added to the hysteria with their anti-vampire -vampi ointments and talismans. 
East Central Europe was no stranger to wars or epidemics, successive waves of black death, smallpox, and pestilence having been having repeatedly savaged the regions in the generations prior to the vampire outbreaks. Only later was it generally noticed that the bulk of vampire reports came from the frontier region where Catholic Hungarians and Orthodox Serbs and Valaks intermingled, where the peasant population was most exposed to the dire consequences of false belief, as described in the warnings of the rival faith. The multiplying persecution of alleged vampires that ensued was instrumental in turning popular superstition into an actual hysterical epidemic with diagnosable symptoms. Local communities took the law into their own hands, digging up the graves of suspected vampires, until Rome, angered by the heresies preached by the orthodox schismatics, established an effective legal framework for official vampire trials. These trials did not set out to establish the nature of vampirism or its causes, far less the guilt or innocence of the accused. They restricted themselves to the Catholic, Catholic precept that, as vampires depended for their existence on the devil, it was God's will that, sh that they should be destroyed. God permitted Satan to tempt mankind through evil, in this instance through vampirism, thereby justifying a resolute Christian campaign to er eradicate the undead. But Britain was not part to the vampire craze, was due not to a lesser capacity for superstition, but to the effects of the Reformation. Part of the Catholic explanation of vampirism it depended as already mentioned, on the doctrine of purgatory. The Protestant challenge denied the existence of purgatory and therefore insisted that beings returned from the grave could not be the spirits of the departed. In time, Rome would amend its association between the undead and purgatory, but Protestant clerics, needing an alternative explanation for the vampire ph phenomenon, subsumed it under the category of witchcraft. Consequently, while Central and Eastern Catholic or Orthodox Europe suffered with from vampires, Northwestern Protestant Europe suffered its witches. Britain was b virtually bereft of any indigenous vampire law. When the 18th century invasion did take place, it would do so not through folklore, but through literature. Chapter 12, The Turret and the Grail. Dracula is, like most major gothics, a book given to symbols and images archetypal in its design. Like the other big gothics, it is a book of myth, a book which mirrors consistently and insistently in its use of metaphor and in its meaning certain truths of the whole human spirit. Most gothics end happily, and Dracula is no exception. The happiness of its ending is that it ends in knowledge. Thus the happy ending of Dracula, of the fool's quest in the turret, of any story in which the quester comes home. Thomas Ray Thornburg, The Quester and the Castle. To present the religious dimension of Dac Dracula, is simply a parody of biblical events is to oversimplify. There is another aspect to the re religiosity of the novel which transcends any straightforward god devil, good devil dic dichotomy. Thornburg has suggested, as a companion of ancient arcana, Dracula knows few rivals in fiction, and as a work of art which demonstrates the properties of world myth and archetype, and the diabolical reversal thereof, the book has no equal. Through Dracula, Bram Stoker delves into the world of the arcane and the myth, illustrating his deep familiarity with its occult and literary expression. Where better to begin the search for some of Stoker's hidden meanings than in the mysteries of the turret cart? No one can feel completely confident about the time and place of their origins, 
nor their visual representations, far less their meanings. It is probable that the modern facts evolved from various sources and traditions, Christian, Gnostic, Islamic, Celtic and Norse, although one school of thought claims that the tarot offers a compendium of arcane wisdom which stemmed from ancient Egypt. Ram Stoker's involvement with Egyptology was given full expression in the Jewel of Seven Stars, and his wider occult interests removed sensible doubts about his familiar familiarity with the tarot. The cards themselves can be put to several uses. Most familiar is their occult re reputation as guides for divination or for predicting the future. They can, however, also be used for games, being the procurers of the modern pack of playing cards. A tarot deck is comprised of 78 cards divided into two series. It is the larger, the minor arcana, which resembles the familiar modern pack, being arranged into four suits, each numbered one to ten, plus jack, knight, queen and king. For the purposes of relating the tarot to, Dr to Dracula, we must turn to the 22 cards which make up the, ma the major arcana, the trumps. Many oculists are of the opinion that these cards taken as a whole embody a systematic key to the mysteries of mankind, God and the universe, and the path to be taken to acquire this knowledge. The major arcana lays down a system of initiation harboring a secret language of symbolism, the unfathoming of which is the task that befalls the quester after self-knowledge. These cards are numbered 1 to 21, with an extra card, the Fool, unnumbered, but usually placed first. The, neg the negative side of the Fool, the Joker, survives also as an outsider in the modern pack of cards. The major arcana of the tarot is as follows. The Fool. The fool. One, the Magician. Two, the Papess. Three, the Empress. Four, the Emperor. Five, the Pope. Six, the Lovers. Seven, the Chariot. Eight, Justice. Nine, the Hermit. 10, the Wheel of Fortune, 11, Fortitude, 12, the Hanged Man, 13, Death, 14, Temperance, 15, the Devil, 16, the Tower of Destruction, 17, the Star, 18, the Moon, 19, the Sun, 20, the Day of Judgment, 21, the World. These cards, if taken, taken sequen sequentially, are symbolic of, symbolical of the classical Gnostic quest of the kind featured in the myths and the legends around the world and exemplified by the divinely assisted quest of Jason and the Argonauts for the Golden Fleece. The hero journeys forth encountering hazards and peril of every conceivable kind progressing stage by stage on a voyage through life towards the goal of redemption. The cards are capable of multiple interpretation, hence the enduring fascination with them. But it is possible, nevertheless, to extract some of the personal personalities and themes from Dracula and discuss them in the light of the symbolism of the major arcana. For one thing, the cards feature the recurring image of a ruined castle which dominates the novel's opening and concluding sections. The cross, too, is represented in the turret, as are cutting and thrusting images pertinent to, to the phenomenon of vampirism. Let us start with the fool. This card depicts a man standing on the edge of a precipice and surrounded by mountains. He is ready to step out into the supreme adventure, accompanied only by his Dick Whittington bag, on a stick and a small dog. The fool is representative of every man, the ordinary person, faced with the trials and tribulations of encountering new worlds in his search for the meaning of life. Jonathan Harker is manifestly an archetypal 
example of the questioning fool. He is inexperienced, naive, yet not without inner sense of expectation that does not close his mind to unusual experiences. Such as travelling alone to the primitive waste of Transylvania, the fool frequently embarks upon his quest for wisdom through a blunder or by accident. The undertaking is rarely planned. Sure enough, Harker has packed his bags only because gout prevented his employer making the trip himself. Likewise, the fool is, at the outset, often given advice or warnings which he either fails to understand or prefers to ignore. Protective figures may appear who provide gestures of godly assistance, such as the crucifix pressed upon the, the solicitor by a, a well-meaning old woman. In fact, his determination to keep his appointment with Dracula, when every instinct within him tells him to delay or flee, marks Harker down as a fool in its everyday meaning, as well as that of the turret. Even when ensconced in the castle, he appears perversely oblivious to the peril he is in.